think about what you can do in your organization to start to uh, implement this thing. So I'll start by trying to define the four words. Have you noticed there are four words on the title? I'll try to describe it. I will not define it. I mean, this is not necessarily an academic session. I'll try to describe it so that we can relate with it. And then I will then uh, go on to talk about the business case, why you should do this. You know, for us, for us to drive any change in nature, you have to create a business case, why we need to get this done. And finally, I'll conclude by some seven steps that I think we can all take to start that journey. So let me start by the one that most people are likely familiar, and that's diversity. Um, diversity is a representation of the diverse sets in any system. So when you think about things like um, um, colors, for example, if you think about colors, imagine if the world had only one color. You know, some of you can relate with this very well. You know, when I don't know when you were younger, many years ago, I used to easily say when we were younger, but this is when I talk about when you were younger, I realize some people don't even, were not even born when I was fine, so they can't relate with the story. But when I was younger, a television set in Nigeria had only one color. How many people can remember black and white color? Everything was black and white. There was there was nothing different. And I remember that at a point, a dear friend of mine told me that we can do something different to make our TV. Then some people started to buy color TV. Yes, thank you, Rabin Bola. Some people started to uh, buy color TV and we loved it. We loved the colors. It made the pictures come out well. Then I remember a dear friend told me that we can turn our black and white TV into a colored television. He said, if you go and look for Lucozid, I don't know which, how many people know Lucozid, the Lucozid bottle had this wrap around it that was a different color. So he said, if we take that wrapper and we paste it on our television, <laughs> the television will become colored. Of course, we did the experiments, right? Uh, and then the our TV did not become colored. Our TV only became the color of Lucozit. I don't know how many of you experimented. About, if you never experimented, but that is what diversity is in a nutshell. It's an agreement and an, a realization that there are differences in the world. So diversity is a fact. There is no need to argue about diversity. We're different. Some people are tall. Um, you know, when, before I started becoming a diversity champion, I used to use words anyhow, but these days I've become very conscious. So, you know, before you say some people are tall, but some people are short. No, you don't say that it's not diversity sensitive. Some people are tall, some people are vertically challenged. You don't say they are short. They are vertically challenged. Some people are slim, right? You don't say they are thin. While some people are laterally endowed, right? Uh, so those are languages. Some people are black, some people are white, some people are colored, some people speak with an accent, some people are Yoruba, some people are Igbo, so they are Muslims, they are Aousas. It's a reality. So diversity is an acceptance that that diversity, that difference, is good for any system. Just like you, imagine you can only see, ah, Ogaka, I'm not there. You said so, I'm laterally endowed. I'm not there. I didn't come to work today. Oh. <laughs> and the word you said, vertically challenged. Oh, no, no, Madam Abimbola, you're not vertically challenged. Uh, maybe you are symptomatically aligned to the equator. And in that way, you are not, uh, you are not really vertically challenged. Now, so they are, they are, they, they, it's just you accepting that we are better off when we are different. Because there's a sense in which some of us feel that our life will be better if we are all the same. So imagine, my name is Yomi Fawemina. Imagine everybody in the world, the 7 billion people who are exactly like me. It will be a very boring world, right? So if I'm talking to the other Yomi, who is going to be listening? But the world is beautiful because of diversity. They say diversity is the spice of life. Now, some of you will argue against diversity. You know, I want people to look like me. But you know, I tell people, if you argue with me about diversity, you see, don't have children. Don't have children. Because what happens is that once you have a first child, it's going to look like either you or your spouse. But if you have a second child, it shall never look like the first child. Anybody here that has two children, can tell me, if you can tell me that your two children are the same, I will give you anything you ask me to give you because it's the reality of life. Your spouse is not likely to look like you. So if we know that, why are we then creating an organization where people look similar? 
Why do we want everybody in your organization to be Yorubas or to be Christians? I hope nobody gets offended. I'm also a Christian. I'm a pastor. But the question you need to ask yourself that why, why are you insisting everybody should be male? Why are you insisting everybody should be female? Why are you insisting everybody should be young? Why are you insisting everybody should be old? Why are you insisting um, it's your age mates that should be in HR leadership? Why? Why? So diversity is you recognizing that we're different and that there is value in that difference. And that's where diversity ends. Now, so let us assume now that we have all agreed that we are different and there is value in that difference. That difference will never be maximized except we had inclusion. So, you know, we started with diversity and diversity is I agree that we are different and it's good. Uh, what now brings value from the diversity is inclusion. So while we are different, what are we doing to ensure everybody feels included? So you go to a meeting, for example, you will see diversity in a meeting. So um, in, that diverse, in that meeting, there are those that will talk. You know, once you say, um, um, uh, so should we turn left or right? They raise their hand and say, let's turn left. Or some will raise their hand and turn right. Some will not talk. It's not that they don't have opinion, because that's sometimes what we do. We we'll say the person did not say anything, so that means he had it. No, it's only that he didn't say it. He has what he has in his mind. So you go to that meeting and you recognize, based on what we have talked about, that there are people are going to have different opinions. But what are you going to do to ensure that everybody is treated respectfully and can contribute in spite of their difference? For example, those that know me very well know that I'm a little bit very clinical in, in the way I try to analyze things. And I could insist on what I think is right. I personally, uh, because of my background um, in social activism, student unionism, and then I became a Christian and I started to see values that made me realize that everything that happened in this world is because some people spoke out, spoke out for others. I have that interest to speak out for others and i could be very insistent on me so if you recognize i'm different from you maybe you don't talk right there's a tendency that if you are not careful you will use you will use that against me and you don't allow me to talk by not inviting me to meetings you know there are some organizations they do that they'll say don't invite social so person to me say why why don't you invite him say it's because if he comes he will scatter everything he will scatter everything so that is what takes out the value from diversity. Inclusion is when we recognize people are different, which is diversity, and we now demonstrate the behaviors that makes everybody feels like contributing and that their contribution is valued. I, I, I had to deal with one project many years ago. They had this team where the manager was struggling and was struggling because of the fact that the, um, the employees, they, 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 they had problem with some particular guy in that team. And you know, they, they felt they should exclude him. So exclude him. They felt it was disrupting things. You know, the guy was very critical. So if you say you want to build a house, the guy will tell you, you can't build the house because it's raining. You can't build the house because it's sunny. It's very critical and analytical. And they, they felt, so they were not inviting him to project meetings. So they brought it to me and they asked me what intervention we can do. And I just asked a question, I said, do you people see value in what this person said? No, it's, we don't want, it's too negative. It's too negative. It, does, it should not be on a project team. So I now said, wait, why don't you do this? In your project management system, you showed me your, because I asked for their project management system. In phase one and phase two of their project, they generate projects. In phase three, they do risk analysis for those alternatives, right? So I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you leave the guy? Let him not come to where you are deciding to build a house so that he doesn't come with his criticism there. But when you have decided that should we build bungalow or upstairs or, or duplex or whatever, why don't you bring him in as your risk analyst to help you identify the risk with which choice and help you choose the one that is very risky? They say, hey, no, it's negative. I said, no. It's not negative, it's only risk conscious. Because we use those labels to put people, give people a bad name. 
many of the people will say are negative people. They are not negative people. It's only that they are more risk conscious than you are. You are more risk averse than they are. And honestly, if you know this, if you are in any relationship with everybody, you realize that we don't have the same tolerance for risk. So somebody that is more risk averse will be called negative. It's not negative. It's only risk averse. I said, so bring him in at the point of that and let him critique your solutions. And they said, you think, it's, I said, it's going to work. And then they went to do it and they said, the guy was fantastic. We came with seven options. He helped us to show the pros and cons of each one, told us which one will not work. After he finished, we knew what we should not do. I said, that is how to use people like that. But it was because they recognized this difference and deployed it. That is what inclusion does. They allowed him to contribute in his own way. So I told you that diversity is a fact. Inclusion is not a fact. Inclusion is a behavior. It's a set of behaviors. So those people chose to behave well to this guy, and they were able to get value from it. And like I told them while I was saying, I said, you know what? As you mean, you have an hairline. You have a plane that you have designed, brand new plane. Do you need a critic to help you know whether you're going to, whether you're going to have a plane crash. Ah, they say, yeah, so we want somebody that will critique it and all of that. I asked them, I said, when they were having all those arguments, COVID-19 vaccine, I said, every time they were saying it's not good to work, did you know that it made the scientists do more work to ensure that all the arguments didn't work? I said, so criticism is not bad. The problem we have is that we don't have the inclusive behaviors to harness that thing. And of course, the first mistake we make is that we call it negative. We call it criticism is actually race consciousness. So I've told you, I accept people are different, that's diversity. I would change my behavior to accommodate their difference and make them feel welcome, that is inclusion. The third part of it is equity. Remember, I'm trying to define diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. Yeah, Okwe, thanks for that. He said, place people in positions where they are best fit. Very, very apt way to describe it. Because, you know, one of the things we don't do well in the workplace, which footballers don't do well, is the fact that, you know, footballers, they put you in the best place. If you have left, use your left leg, they put you on the left. If you use your right leg, they put you there. If you can defend, they put you at the back. If you can strike, they put you forward. If you can hold the ball, you are called a midfielder, right? That's what coaches do. Coaches don't force people. It's, it's weird. I will force people. You know this person doesn't care about people. This person is not passionate about people. He's not interested. You will post him and say, you're going to become a business partner. Why? Why? This guy just wants to be in class training. That's all he does well. Why don't you just keep him there? So we have talked about diversity. We have talked about inclusion. Let's talk about equity. Equity, it's about fair treatment. Remember, equity is about fair treatment. So I recognize you are different. I will do the right behaviors to make you feel included, but I'll treat you fairly to ensure that you are able to still contribute. And this equity part is very, very important because when I told you that diversity is a fact, uh, inclusion is a behavior, equity is a mindset, right? So diversity is a fact, inclusion is a behavior, equity is a mindset. And it's a mindset that looks out for the disadvantage in that workplace and tries to bring them up. Please note, it is equity, not equality. So I give you this instance. Let's say, for example, um, this organization, this organization has 100 leaders and they realize that there's no single woman there. And the organization based on diversity says, we want women to, to become leaders in this organization based on diversity. And then based on inclusion, they start to give women opportunity and all of that. And say, so, okay, whenever we go to, uh, whenever a woman applies for a job, uh, we will encourage women to apply for a job. We will encourage them to do this. You see, you may realize that after three years, there may still be a hundred men on that board and no woman. Why? Equity is lacking. Equity should not ask the question. If you already have 100 men ahead and there's no woman in leadership, and based on inclusion, you want women to get to leadership, you need to start to create equity solutions to facilitate those women there. So you can, for example, say at any time that there is a job interview and a woman comes second or third, we will pick the woman, we will not pick the man. That is equity. 
or maybe it's about disability. You say based on inclusion, oh, I've come to this class and I agree, yes, diversity, I, we need to have disabled people in the organization. Okay, good. Then secondly, we now say, okay, we'll start to change our ramp. We'll start to, um, we'll start to uh, produce braille's and all of those things uh, to show inclusion. But equity will now be like, wait, so when we are doing tests to admit people to work here, we don't have people that can do tests in braille. We don't, right? So what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about if somebody has cerebral crossing? Again, I, I had to mention this because it's something I had to discuss with somewhere just this week. You know, for somebody that has cerebral crossy, the very extreme time, you know, one of their biggest problems is coordination, right? So while they can learn, and some of them are extremely brilliant, they can't write because they can't coordinate. You know, handwriting is a coordination exercise. So they can coordinate and write. So imagine this guy who is a graduate who has cerebral palsy, whether he had it from birth or he developed after now, he now wants to come for your job interview or he wants to come for your skill test or whatever test. Is there equity that can allow this guy to come and write that test? Because remember, you ask everybody to write the test. He cannot write the test. He cannot write. So equity asks that question, what can we do to ensure this guy is able to write this test? And you may just say, bring somebody that will write for you. That's what WAG did uh, three years ago. They allow people that have cerebral process to bring people to write for them. So they dictate and somebody writes. Will you accept that? Will you do that in your organization? That is equity. A couple of years back, I had to go to a meeting with uh, some set of people. An organization asked me to come and help negotiate something with some agitators they had. They, and the agitators were blind. They were all blind. So I invited them, invited them to a meeting. I remember the meeting was at Protea Hotel in Lekki. And those guys came there. And you know, I had somebody who was my secretary who was going to write. I had somebody representing the company who was also writing for the company. And then these five blind guys were also in the room. So when the meeting started, I can't forget the story, right? When the meeting started, the my recorder was recording, the company's recorder was recording there. The blind guys brought out a tape recorder. They brought out a tape recorder and a press play. So I was like, hey, 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 guys, we came here to resolve a conflict. My role as a mediator is to mediate between you and between this company. I don't know why are you trying to record what everybody said. Nothing should be written. Nobody should be quoted verbatim and all of that. So their president laughed. <laughs> he said, sir, have you forgotten we are blind? We can't take minutes of meeting. So what we are doing is that we will record what you have said, then we'll go and give somebody to type it out for us. That was when it says it's true. This guy is the only way they can capture what happened is by recording it. I did not understand that equity part. So equity is about allowing everybody to have a chance. I give you another example. Happened many years ago. Um, the US government decided that they wanted to start, you know, when the when the NASA program, NASA program, the space program of years, they took a decision and said they wanted women to become astronauts. It was a decision they took. And then they weren't getting women. But then they now realize that NASA had a policy that said that for you to become an astronaut, you must have been a former pilot. So they realized that, okay, when we say we are not getting women in NASA, the problem is that we're not getting former pilots who are female. Then they realize that the policy of the aviation ministry was that only men can be pilots. So NASA said, I want to employ women as astronauts, but for you to be an astronaut, uh, NASA says you must have been a pilot, which is fair. But the schools that train people for pilots said only men can be pilots. Can you see how that equity will never allow them to have female pilots? So sometimes when you say we want to hire more people from the community where we operate from, we want to do this, it's because you're not looking at the equity aspect. I've, I've said it everywhere I've gone to. Walmart did a project three years ago. They realized that they weren't having enough black people in leadership in Walmart in the US. And then they started encouraging black people to apply for jobs. But then they realized that the problem is that the black people they hired, they already, they already work for Walmart while working on the shop floor. 
So you have this black guy on the shop floor who works for eight hours standing on his feet. Now his colleague, who is a white guy, is in the office. So when both of them close, the white guy has been sitting in the office. He can go and do evening classes. This guy who has been on the shop floor, right, who has um, who has who has stood for the next eight uh, last eight hours, will not close and go to school. He's going to sleep. So they now realize that hey, we need to incentivize this black guy to so be able to go to school after that. And then they came up with a scheme to make that happen. The point is equity is about ensuring that people are allowed to have fair treatment, not necessarily equal treatment, fair treatment. So question is, are you fair to people? When I was young, um, uh, when I was young, I didn't care about older people. You know, I, I felt that the organization was set up for older people, but these days, you know, you, you go, you, you you look for a job, you go on an interview, and when you show up on the um, when you show up on the Zoom call for the interview or wherever, and they see that you are all great, everybody's already saying that ah, this man is a good job. Why should you employ an old man? Twenty five years ago, I didn't care about that, right? Twenty five years ago, I didn't care about that. You know, so are we giving fair treatment to the young people in our organization? Are we giving fair treatment to the men? Are we giving fair treatment? to people that are not in dominant organization. I apologize, I need to save this occasion like to keep hydrated. I had to do this project for an organization recently. It's an accounting organization. And I said, do you guys feel that you are fair to non-accountants? <laughs> the HR director says, I'm being serious with you. We're not fair to them. If you're not an accountant, you can't get some positions, even though the position was not an accounting position. Fair treatment. So if you work for, National Electric Power Authority, for example, where engineers dominate. Is it engineers that also go to head HR and hold head supply chain? And every professional has to almost get forced to become engineers before they can become anything. The last concept is belonging. Um, belonging is about people feeling accepted in the organization, right? Um, it looks very close to inclusion, but Inclusion is you directing to others. Belonging is the way the person feels about the inclusion. Because you can, you can think you are being inclusive, but the person doesn't feel it belongs. So for example, you say, oh, what we're going to do is that we're going to employ people from other parts of Nigeria. That we realize in Afghanistan, everybody is you, but everybody is equal. We want to employ for that part of Nigeria. But the behaviors that will make the Yoruba man in this civil organization feel belong with different. I'm going to give you an instance I'm, and I'm giving you a, a real example. All the examples I give you are real. So there are projects I've worked on for various organizations around the world. So I'm not I'm not making them up. I, I, I give you this organization. It's a bank. And please don't guess. Eh? The way of agreement you will not guess the bank. I will try and describe the banks more so that you can understand. The bank is a Nigerian bank. Majority of the owners of the bank are Igbos. Hmm? Don't think it's not color red bank, so it's not color red bank. Don't think about that. It's not color red. I, I won't go anytime beyond that. So the bank was doing a board meeting and they took a decision that everybody on our board was able. Actually, the chairman of the board at that instance was a king, he's an AZ. And I was telling them joke like that, you people, you are so egotic that you can't even look for a regular woman as the chairman. You want to look for a king. When a king of, when an AZ is the chairman of the board, how do you want to argue in that board meeting? How? It's just like I go to a board meeting, I'm from Odo and Yoshima, where is the chairman? Once he says anything and he looks at me twice, I remember his power in our hometown, I keep quiet. So I said, I mean, what? but hey, they're taking that decision. So, they now took a decision and said, okay, God, what we're going to do first is that we need to bring some Yoruba people and some Yibos and some Aosas to join there. So the first non Igbo person joined the board. It was a first non Igbo person. And you know, the person resumed. I mean, so the project I was involved in. Yeah, the person resumed and it was a first meeting. Of course, everybody that understands that bank knows that it's an Igbo bank, right? So. When they started the meeting, the guy was obvious, it was obvious to the guy that I am, I don't belong here. The guy now said what was most shocking to him was that when they now wanted to serve them snacks, 
at the meeting. They snacks them, garden egg, and cola nut. <laughs> and then the king, because the king was the chairman of the board, they gave him the king the cola to break cola, and say they are bring cola. Bring he said he was just wondering that. He just remembered all the things he read in Things Fall Apart by China Achebe. That he said, no, 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 no. This is not where I'm going to be. I can't work here. So that organization did not foster a sense of belonging on this person. But this guy didn't resign in state. He now said the next time they had a general meeting with senior managers, that two of them came late. He is Ibo, and the other person is, no, this person is, is Yoruba, and the person he came late who was in love with junior was uh, Ibo. So he said, when he got into the room, right? So this is this Yoruba man who is just joining the organization and there is this Ibo colleague of his who is junior to him. He said the two of them entered the conference room at the same time. He said, one of the Ibo managers on the desk stood up and came to ask his junior to come and take his seat and they left him standing. Do, do, do you realize that? Now, for you to understand how so somebody says it's not a village meeting. Yeah, and it happens in many organizations. I've had to go to board meeting where people talk half of the time in Yoruba language. And I'm like, yeah, but there are no Yoruba people here. Why are you speaking Yoruba there? Or sometimes when we hold those meetings, some people are in the room and some people are on offline. And then we don't remember people are offline. It's part of those sense of belonging. So, that's the context of diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. All four should be present in your organization to maximize the difference. So why should we be bothered about this? So I'll just talk about five business cases for diversity and inclusion. One, you have better decision making. You can take better decisions. Cadbury PLC, like I said, I'm going to give real examples you can get with. Cadbury PLC, the number one product of Cadbury in Nigeria is TomTom. It's TomTom. They sell more Tom Tom than any other product. The next set of products they produce in Cadbury that sells a lot are all things they use in the home. Whether you want to think about Bonvita, Toma Pep, and all of those things, right? They, they, it's it, their own, not cubes, their own based, own based, own used products. Question, what determines what will be bought to use to eat in the home? Who determines whether a child will drink Bonvita or Milo? Who determines whether you will use Toma Pep or something else? Who? The mother. But Cadbury had no woman on their board. They had no, yes, mommy, yes. Thanks, Vivian, for that. Thanks. I'll quite also say mom. But Cadbury had no woman on their board. And while Cadbury was older in Nigeria, Nessu came later. And Nassau started to drag Bombita with Milo. Nassau started to drag Toma Pep with their own products. And then Kaku realized that Edro, something is wrong. Where well, this Nessu guy seems to be understanding. Kaku now decided they were going to make Mrs. Awoshika the chairman of Kaku. And she became the first female of the board of Kaku. And then they started to realize that there's certain things they discuss about products that when that woman contributes, they realize that hmm, we never thought about this. That is part of the benefit of diversity and inclusion. And Cadbury was able to turn the corner. I'll give you another example, Fidelity Bank. Fidelity Bank is in Nigeria, it's a Nigerian bank. Fidelity Bank had this sweeter account for children. It's for target as children, young children. It's an account you're supposed to open for your child before they become age 10, very beautiful account. So they started the account and launched it in, I think in Lagos and Enugu. And there was this small girl, who took a picture in that, in the poster had this one beautiful girl, she had to, to, she made her hair, you know, that thing that looks like that beautiful one, they had all manner of trinkets on it, well-dressed. But the girl wore a dress that exposed her belly button, you know, it was a jumper dress. Yeah, this was like a four or five year old girl, right? So it doesn't even make it, she wasn't exposing herself, but her nevels were exposed and then she wore a very beautiful skirt. Now, when they were going to launch the same product in Kano, they showed up in Kano with billboards of this girl with her tummy exposed. Fidelity Bank pulled down that advert before they launched the product. Why? 
it was seen on Islamic for a girl to expose her belly button. Diversity. If they had a Muslim on the board of Fidelity Bank, that Muslim would have said, this picture, eh, this picture, uh, it can't fly in canon. Right? So that is one of the beauty of diversity and inclusion. You have better decisions. They can tell you, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. Coke. Coke went to India. Coke created a new product and called it a name in the US. They changed, they got to uh, they got to Canada, and they did not ask anybody in Asia whether it's that. No, it was in China. They got to China, and that name was offensive in China. They actually had to apologize. Same thing has happened. Same thing happened to Leno Messi. Leno Messi. I'm saying diversity you know, makes us make better decisions. Leno Messi had a boy or in Egypt who showed the love Messi. Messi, I mean, I'm sure we know Lionel Messi, the footballer. Messi now wanted to appreciate the guy, finish the match, remove the shoes, and posted it to the guy. However, in Arabic culture, sending a shoe to somebody is an insult. Right? So, but if, 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 if Lionel Messi has consulted with his Arabian friends, that can I send my shoe to somebody? It will not make that. So the first thing will make better decision making. Of course, if you have better decision, there will be better products. Number two, there is increased profits. Because when you make better decisions, you make more money. You create more products that means the need of people. I was, um, uh, a few years ago, um, the school invited me to join their board. I mean, one of the things I do by the side is I sit on the board of various organizations. Um, the school invited him to join that board and the school was doing well. So after some time, I told them, I want to resign from this board. They said, why? I said, because, you know, I, I don't have any child with it. The school is a preschool and kindergarten. I said, I don't have any child in that. And so I don't understand this word again. He said, what do you mean? I said, you see, I don't have any child in primary school. I don't have any child in basic secondary school. I said, so when, when those days when I could come up with ideas, it was because I had children in that, that I, I don't have children there, one, two. I don't have friends who have children in that world again. So I can't, I can't relate well with that world. Now, what happens to many organizations is that they don't create a renewal of the board and therefore the product starts to go down, right? So they struggle. So you, may, you, you can make more problems. Number three, uh, when people see... Uh, Oh yes, Oluchi, oh, Oluchi, great example. The Agege bread and the Sterling Bank example. Very apt example of how diversity, thanks, thanks Oluchi for bringing that home. I, oh, I love Sterling Bank at bad. Very creative, very innovative. But then they did one, and I didn't really feel offended with it, but some people felt offended. They said, Jesus rule like Agege bread and people carry their matter on their head. But again, Diversity helps us to not get into those things. Do you know diversity also helps us to take better decisions as regards employee benefits? You know, there are some benefits you give people of my age that we would like. You give a 25 year old and we want to, what is this? You know, my, um, my friends, this was like 30 years ago. My friend's father retired from Nigerian bureaus. Yeah, Nigerian bureaus. And on his retirement day, they give, I think he has spent 35 years. They gave him a clock, a war clock, you know, and presented it to him. So when they came back, the son was like, he doesn't know why they gave his daddy a war clock. I just said, maybe it's just for them to, but maybe Nigeria is telling the man that you should have been checking the time. What are you looking for here for 35 years? But you know, in those days, it was okay to give people war clock. But you do long service award for a 35 year old person and you're giving war clock. If you're wondering, why are you, give, I don't even have a war clock. You know, I don't even have, I don't care about work work. So part of this is decision making. Number four, number three is that it helps people to become more compliant, so they're more, more committed to the organization. When the organization makes you feel belonging, when the organization makes, treats you equitably, when the organization considers that when you're pregnant, you should not be punished, you know, then you will likely be committed, right? The organization realizes that, ah, these people treat me with respect, then the employee will be committed. Two days ago, uh, Microsoft actually was writing an article about uh, Microsoft announced it was going to lay off staff. And he said that all the staff that will be laid off will be given six months notice. And then they will put them on the health insurance for the next six months after they are sacked. 
why will you not be committed to that kind of organization? Number four, legal compliance. There are aspects of diversity and inclusion and equity and belonging that is legal, that you can be jailed for not doing it. And I always try to emphasize it because when you talk about this diversity and people will think that you are just trying to get people excited, there are legal implications. I was writing, I did some series of tweets two days ago to let people know that the Federal Character Commission can come to a private company and say that you have employed too many Yorubas. By law, they can do that. It can come to your organization and says you need to have diversity of men and women. The law allows them to do that. So part of this diversity and inclusion thing is, is legal compliance. You can get into trouble for doing that. How many people remember? I mean, I, I, I wrote um, a paper recently on uh, women and gender issues. How many people remember the case uh, for against Clinton Foundation in the US that was taken to the National Industrial Court? This man, this lady was pregnant and she was sacked while she was pregnant and she went to court and rightly so. And the court held that it was against her human rights. Uh, there was a young lady that reached out to me last year from Nevada. Uh, she was sacked by a radio station because she had rotarism. Rotarism is that thing that doesn't allow you uh, to, to, to pronounce ow. You know the people that say ow, ow. And then she was employed by a radio station and then she was sacked because of rotarism. And she contacted me in Canada. And say, what do I do about it? And I'm like, hey, guy, go to court. The court protects you. The court says that any, you cannot be discriminated anything on account of your bat. Rotarism came as a result of your bat. So sometimes we are able to protect ourselves from legal exposure when we do that. And finally, it just creates a better world um, uh, um, at the end of the day. So what should we do? Because I need to start to round up now so I can respect your time. I think we should just do three things. I mean, one of the things I try to do for organizations is I help organizations develop strategies. I know basically strategy is three things. Where are we? Where do you want to be? How do we get there? So those are the three things you need to do. Where are we? Where do we want to be? How do we want to get there? So you have to say, where are we in this diversity journey? Do I even know as a child, do I know how many people are Yorubas and Igbos, how many Muslims and Christians? Do I know how many people are young or old? That's that's part of what you want to do is social analysis. Where are we? Where are you? Are you are, where are you? You need to understand where you are, right? Where do you have gaps? I, I mean, I, I one of the jobs I did in recent times is I went to work for a mini refinery and uh, I was the lead child there. And they, they were a department that had no, no woman supervisor. And I was like, this is not right. Let's, let's do something about it. And one of my most accom accomplishments in life was that by the time I left that place, for a group that had, had not had a full mind professor in 15 years, we got one in, in, while I was there. I was there for less than two and a half years. A group had had no female supervisor for 50 years, five zero years. We got a supervisor before I left, right? A group had had no female superintendent for 20 years. We got a female superintendent before I left. Those are the things, that's where you are. So I describe where we are. Then the next thing you want to describe where you want to be. So all these things I said that we did, I didn't just sit there at and say, oh, there's no woman here, there's no one there. I convinced the men that, wait, let me ask you a question. Like I told somebody once that, wait, okay, think about it now. Those, all those women who, can, who are not supervisors now, no, you have daughters. Are you, are you hoping that one day your daughter will come and work and she can't become a supervisor? I said, no. I mean, did they not go to Unilag? Why would the man? I said, so that's why we need to create the platform for those women to become supervisors. I know for, for one of them, I enjoyed the fact that I was able to advocate and get them where to be. I mean, let me describe this to you. Again, it, it's a true life story. Uh, they wanted to employ somebody in this organization and, uh, as HR business partner. So HR business partner I was at that point. They came and said, okay, um, so we would, um, this is the requirement for the job. Everybody in that job before that time was a man. In 50 years, 50 years, men. Virtually all of them were engineers. Virtually all of them were engineers. So when they came the job that back to me, you know, part of our process is that they bring the job out to the business partner, he reviews it before it goes to recruitment. So I saw the job requirements wanted graduates of uh, engineering or science. That's what they wanted. So I went to meet the, the head of the group. I said, sir, I just, I checked the job description. I, I, I know this job. This job is not an engineering job. He said, no, 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 I mean, it's an engineering job. I said, sir, I know this job. 
I know one of the things when I went to God's work in that refinery, I, I remember one of the superintendent calls and I said, the problem I have with you is that you know too much about this plant and it doesn't help me do what I like to do. I said, what do you mean, sir? He said, you see, you understand every job, you understand the plant. I see you in the plant. I mean, as a child for that plant, I wear coverall. I go inside the plant. If you, if you don't see my office, I'm in the plant. So when somebody is telling me that this reactor, there's a need for us to hire an operator and all of that, I know the operators there. I know the plant. I can't operate it, but I know what's that. So I said, sir, this job is not an engineering job. This job is an analytical job. So the man said, he doesn't agree. I said, sir, so you gave me the job description. Let's go through you line by line. You listed six core jobs. There is none of them that is engineering. Of course, the new one is engineering, but he's an engineer. I know how engineers do their things. Once you make an engineer the head of a group, every role in that group, you will tell the engineer should be there. So I said, sir, you know that this job is not an engineer. So let's expand it. You have said you wanted graduates of engineering and also graduates of science. Let's allow people in the humanities to apply. Why can't a graduate of economics use this job? Why can't a graduate of geography do it? He said, I, again, my concern is that they will not be analytical enough. I said, sir, look at it now. We were all in the university. I said, I studied estate management. Me and you, you were in faculty of engineering. I was there, but we both did maths together in part one. Have you forgotten that there were three courses in maths me and you did together? That the other people didn't do it. So the maths you did and the maths I did, we did the same amount of maths. I said, so what is the thing I can't analyze really? So he agreed. They did advertise the job, agreed to put BSc or HND in humanities. They did the test. They did the interview. <laughs> Do you know who came first in the interview? It was somebody that has HND in humanities. And she was a lady. That lady was the first person in 50 years to be a manager in that organization. First person in 50 years. And it was just because they expanded the requirement to say people that did humanities. So part of this thing we're talking about is our role to start to, on, you see, you can't do diversity, inclusion, and belonging well in any organization if you don't organize, understand the organization, right? So you can't be the HR that sits in the office. No, there are different kinds of HR. You know, there's, there are the HR that sits in the office. You know, they bring issues to them. But there's a child that goes into the organization that knows what is happening there. That if something happens, you can practically run the place on your own. So you must define where you are, you must define where you want to be, and then you must describe how you want to get there. In my view, there are nine things that can help you get there. I'm going to run through them. Clear. One, there must be a strategy. Everybody of the organization should have a diversity and inclusion strategy. There must be a clear strategy, clear, clear strategy that defines your vision. Number one. Number two, there must be leadership. Um, there must be leadership sponsorship. You must get people in leadership to, to be interested uh, in what's, what is happening. You, you can't do this thing on, as a child. Your leaders must be interested, must be very, very interested. They must be very, very interested. Number three, there must be training and education. You must train people on diversity and inclusion because sometimes some people don't know they are, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are not, they are not working, they're not doing the right thing. Honestly, in fairness to them, they think what they are doing is it's 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 it's, it's the correct thing. They are not they are not being wicked. It's just that they don't know what they are doing is bad. So there must be training and education. Number four, there must be reinforcement. We must punish people who don't respect diversity, and we must reward those that that that, that, that recognize it. So there must be reinforcement. Number six, uh, there must be aligning with the existing business practices like hiring. Uh, so for example, are we you won't have a diverse organization if you don't have diverse policies around recruitment and things like that. So if our vision is that we want to have one woman in leadership, the next time we want to advertise for a job, we should be able to, 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 to get a woman, a woman to apply. I mean, I also say things like policies around, you know, Nigerian, Nigerian organization, honestly, practice, this is between me and you. Don't let anybody here outside do. Practicing nature in Nigeria is sweet because nobody will give you any trouble. Eh? I have been, I have managed HR responsibility for two government ministries, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Social Services. There are certain things I can't put in an advert that will put in adverts in Nigeria. Wanted, teller, 
age, not more than 24 years old, male preferred, and all those things we say. Some will even say, most likely it's Shekiri. Eh? You do that in North America, ah, you will pay 10 million naira fine. There is no way you are going to go, you are going to be fined for that. If, if the applicants don't report you, the regulator will report you. So those things are things that we need to start to change by aligning to our various practices. Like I had to ask a bank, why are you telling somebody you want to hire a teller? A teller. What does a teller do? A teller counts money. You say you want the person to be less than 26. Question, why do I need to be less than 26 to count money? Why? Why? It's to count money. My 16 year old, when it was my last month, when it was 16 years old, can count money. So why is there an age restrict money? You tell me that wanted, you want somebody not less than two one. Two one to do what? Why? In law, there is a basis to discriminate and tell people that you want them to um, have some qualification, but it's called a bona fide requirement. It must be related to the job. So for example, you can say, if I don't have 2020 vision, I can't fly a plane because the law says I need 2020 vision to fly a plane. But you can't say that because I have beers, I can't fly a plane. What's in concern beers with flying plane? What's the business? So there must be, you must start to check your practices, your training, your recruitment, your selection, your, your opportunities, your benefits to be sure that you are doing the right thing. I mean, women get pregnant in Nigeria and some organization will just fire them. I gave you the reported piece of Clinton Foundation. Why do we allow that in Nigeria? Why? I told you, I mean, I've been, wait, I intend to do an anniversary very soon, Seb. Uh, I started teaching in the university in 1996. So um, I will be, is it 30 years now? In the next couple of years, I'm really planning to go keep in my life. But I asked, I, I told somebody my experience teaching at the Lagos Business School. Every time I teach on diversity and inclusion, I always have a section on gender where I talk about gender issue in diversity and inclusion. In most of my classes, and I hope nobody will mis misunderstand me, in most of my classes, the people that oppose me the most on gender issues on diversity are women. Oh, I still remember one woman who sat in front of my class and said, I do not agree to you because you are saying that we should change our policy to make it allowable for women who are pregnant to do this, to do that, to do this. When I was pregnant, I was working till the day I delivered. And when I delivered, so I said, ma, I said, you know, with due respect to, I said, you know, the only reason why there is inheritance is that two generations should not suffer the same thing. So you, you, you work till your ninth month, Part of your vision in life is to ensure that it doesn't happen to any other woman. He said, no, I know. If I was able to do it, they should be able to do it. I said, that's the point I'm making. They should, you were forced to do it. Were you happy to do it? He said, no. I said, so why do you want somebody to do it? So we need to check our policies about women, about disabled people, about people that have mental health challenges, about people that have that at the end of the day. And honestly, all of us can be there. So all of this thing, I mean, I, I, I remember once, so when um, when Lagos State, uh, when under Governor Pashala passed the law that allows men, Lagos State civil servants to go on paternity, leave, I wrote it there. And then not so long after, Edo State did the same thing. I wrote to public account, Adams or Shirley, Sullivan Chime of Enugu State, did the same thing, I wrote to applaud it. And then when the federal government now allowed men to go on paternity leave. I also wrote to applaud Mrs. Fola Shadoyesh so on that. And then a woman took me up and said, why am I happy that men are being given paternity leave? I said, ma, the focus of paternity leave is not the man, it's the child. He said, no, those men will not stay at home. I said, that's a marital problem between your husband and wife. It's not the role of government to determine whether husband stay at home or no. It's the role of government to create the environment for the man to stay at home. He can choose not to stay at home. That, that is not a government problem. That's a marriage counseling problem. I said, so that's why we should celebrate government for doing that. I now say, ma, I said, do you know that studies have shown? I said it to her, one of very popular women on the media. I don't want to mention her name. I said, ma, I'm going to send you a study. Most women that suffer postpartum depression globally are women whose husband were not present when they had a child. 
I said, so the first beneficiary of paternity leave is the woman, then the child. So part of why we need to, um, to put in our various practices, number seven or eight, is that we must have rigorous execution. This thing is like, is like gospel. You must put your eye on it. Once you see, this is not working where you raise your hand and say, no, 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 this does not fit with that, 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 that diversity practice. No, no, no. 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 Uh, number um, eight, I don't know what else. There must be monitoring, monitoring to be sure. And finally, there must be continual improvement. This thing is like a vision. You know, strategy is about visioning, right? And the time now you want to achieve that vision. You see, you must always check whether you are making progress towards that vision. Um, and I hope nobody will understand what I want to say. Please, I, I'm not, you know, I, I can't even vote. I'm not in Nigeria at the moment. When uh, the candidates were trying to choose a vice presidential candidate for the election in Nigeria for the presidential election, uh, there was a lot of ulabalu around whether uh, Muslim, Muslim, Christian, Christian, and all of that. And um, when one of the candidates, of course, you know the candidate, I right, decided to choose a Muslim ticket. I, I had an, I had to address a gathering on this, and there were many, some Muslims there. And I told them, I said, you see, the problem I have is not the Muslim Muslim ticket, or even the Christian Christian ticket. I think for me, my own problem is the lack of inclusiveness of others. You know, I said so in this particular ticket. I said so there are two men. So, so. President and Vice President candidate. There are two men, so women are excluded. There are two able-bodied people, so disabled are excluded. There are two former governors, so all of us that were not governors are excluded. There are two elderly men, so young people are excluded. There are two rich people, so poor people are excluded. Then there are two Muslims, then all Muslims are excluded. I said, for me, it's a problem because that person shows lack of appreciation of diversity and inclusion. And by saying it doesn't again, I told the person that four years ago, because this same thing happened in Kaduna State when Governor El Rufai decided to drop uh, um, Batex, Batex, the, the former governor, the former deputy governor who was a Christian and picked a female. I said, you see, I said, you see, when El Rufai took that decision, he, he dropped a Muslim male and picked a female Muslim. It was still a Muslim, Muslim ticket, but it was now a male-female ticket. I said, see, while he excluded Christians, he included women. I said, that's still something that we can do. I said, you see, we must always think about this diversity. You remember I said my second goal is for you to see personally, because when we see it as only as a workplace issue, and again, sorry, my example is not to endorse any candidate, but for us to show that we should stop except, I mean, all the three frontline political parties for election, for example, have male male tickets. I feel that's a big, for me, that's an issue about diversity and inclusion in Nigeria. I think all the three of them, their spokesmen are men, all. Festos Keyamu, uh, what's this man, uh, Dino Melaye, and the other guy for Labour Party. You see, we are creating a world where we're excluding people. And once we include exclude people, they will not feel they, have, they should participate. So why should they bother? I'm saying this for us to realize that this thing is not just about the workplace, it's about the way of life. Ourselves, you, you, you are a dear friend of mine uh, told me many years ago that he wanted me to go and buy a house in an estate. The estate is owned by a church. And uh, that it's members of their church that own the estate. So I told the boss, I said, wait, so how are you living this your Christianity? So you live in a Christian estate, he said yes. Your children attend a Christian school, he said yes. You attend that church twice a week, he said yes. I said, that's your estate. You people have hospital, he said yes. So you attend a Christian hospital, yes. Your children attend a Christian school, he said yes. I said, your wife works in that place or something like that, he said yes. I said, so all your life is revolved around this organization, this Christian. I said, this is your child, eh? this is your child. We now go to University of Lagos, and for the first time is thrown into the world of diversity. That this child is not well being grown well. And I said, you know, let's talk Bible to Bible. The Bible says, go into all the world. It did not say reserve estate for yourself. I said, even when you say you are being Christian, there's nothing called Christian estate. I don't know why this Christian estate has become an issue. You're supposed to have neighbor. 
that is not a Christian that you want to bring to your house fellowship and make him born again. But in your own case, the whole estate is your church. I said, bro, you are not, you are not entering the world. You are reserving yourself. I'm saying this for you to understand how diversity inclusion actually even gets into the church. For those of us that are religious, check many stories in your religious books, whether it's the Quran or the Bible. Many of the problems people have in those books were because of lack of appreciation or diversity and inclusion. I'm going to end with the last one. I wrote about it recently. Many of you know the story of Esau and Jacob. Parents not being able to marry diversity their children. They said because Esau was providing bushmeat for the father, the father liked him. The other one was always at home, the mother liked him. Is that not diversity? You remember that's where we start from. So if a child likes to go out, a child likes to come in. Like that for the parents to harness this difference, they decided to pick sides, which you also do. So a man came online. I had to respond to him on Twitter directly. The man is the CEO of a company in Nigeria. He wrote online that anytime he's on an interview panel, he will always ask whether the person likes football. And if the person says yes, and he will now ask which club he supports. He said, once the person said that the person supports Manchester United, the person has gotten the job. Can you believe that? You are recruiting people based on whether they support Manchester United. How can there be diversity in that? How can you use such a flimsy thing? I mean, it's not even as if the Manchester United, the other name is Red Devils. So you have come an association of devils in your organization. You are now complaining of corruption. <laughs> that was a joke anyway. Now, the point is we need to be deliberate about this. So I'm going to end on that note, and I hope we can have a dialogue. I'll be stopping at this point. And I thank you for the time. I thank you for all the comments. So I hope you found this session very helpful. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Oliyemi for next steps. Thank you so much, ECM Yomi. That was ex phenomenally beautiful. I, we didn't expect or anticipate anything less. Please, let's show some love with our comments, our appreciation in the chat box. Let the chat box be a reflection of what you feel over what you have had in the last one hour or, or thereabout. So as we typically do, we we'll like to take questions and we we'll also like to, to take comments. Priority will be for questions first and foremost, dropped in the chat box. Let's see, if you also like to speak, please raise your hand. Please make sure that your name is your name. If your name looks funny, we may not call you. Um, or if you are just using iPhone 7, we need to be sure there's people that we can relate to. So we'll take a question from Olushego. Please go direct to your question, okay? Question directly, please. Olusegun, you have been empowered to unmute. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead, Olusegun. Okay, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, house. And my question is quite direct. So, on the issues of inclusivity, diversity, and embracing all that, so now the, the dilemma for me now is in a situation where somebody is not organizational fit, are we supposed to like get the person in before saying inclusivity on that note and we decide to get that person in? If the person doesn't fit in into the organization, won't that person feel judged all the way or feel bad <clears throat> that is not that a uh, feel bad in the sense that it doesn't fit in. I don't know if you get the question. Okay, Mr. Yomi, over to you, sir. Okay, um, it depends again on your objective. Um, and thanks for that question. Thanks for asking me, I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, the first thing is that the person should be qualified for the job. I mean, the person should be qualified for the job. Uh, it's, it's a non-negotiable requirement. But sometimes you really don't, you need to ask yourself, does this person really, does, when you say somebody is qualified for the job, it's not like you want to hire doctors and because of diversity, or you say, oh, we want a doctor from Ogun State. Um, uh, so therefore this person did not go to medicine, study medicine in our No, 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 that's not going to happen. But sometimes it's about you asking that question, I'm going to go to Ogun State and I'm going to look for the best doctor there because there are talents all over the world. 
you know, I, I helped that organization they do a project um, some years ago around this. They, they wanted to have specific people to relate with governments in some specific states in Nigeria. And um, I just asked that question, hey, don't, don't advertise in the newspapers alone. Write letters to traditional leaders in those places. I remember very well that the, the, guys who, the guy who they recruited in River State was actually nominated by a traditional ruler. So one of the things we can use for key because one of the problems we have is that the candidate pool we have is too, is too streamlined. So for example, now CIPM wants to hire, um, uh, CIPM wants to hire an accountant, right? So wanted an accountant, so CIPM puts it on the internet or puts it somewhere. I mean, people will say it. Then CIPM members now start to post it in CIPM Ilukeju brand, CIPM Ekiti brand, CIPM Oshobo brand, CIPM whatsoever. What will likely happen is that the eyes that are seeing those adverts, we have many Yoruba people because they're the ones that are seeing the adverts more on WhatsApp. So part of this inclusion is that you will now be very deliberate to say, okay, I want to hire people in Benue states. So after you have done it, you send it to CIPM Benue state, but you call the person in Benue and say, are there opinion leaders? Is there a website? Um, that is prominent in that place. I mean, just like if you want to advertise something very quickly in the bad you, know, you put it in point in the tribune. If you put it in point, people won't buy it because it's tribune. They were, in the olden days, it used to be boom, boom, or sketch. Those days, you remember those days? If you want to recruit people now, maybe for example, you work with Dagote Refinery, you want to put, or put something in Korodu, um, and you're not putting Guardian newspaper, you're wasting your time. You put it in Orisu, Orisu newspaper is what the average person reads in the Korodu. I mean, they make over 500 copies every day of the reason circulating in Korodu alone. So that's the starting point. You, you must have a rich uh, uh, resource pool, but you cannot so co compromise quality just because of inclusion. However, you may need to ask yourself, I don't think you are really demanding for, are they really necessary? Like give the example of the engineering example. I mean, do you really need an engineer for that role? I mean, Let's be very sincere. Do you really need an engineer or you need somebody that is analytical? So that, that would be, I don't think we should ever compromise on quality uh, just because of inclusion. But sometimes you may need to actually re review your quality center to be sure you are really asking the right questions. Thank you so much, sir. I'll start to you You are next, you have the floor. Hello, I'll start with you, Paul. Okay, maybe he's not ready for us. Any other question, or if you'd like to make a contribution or you'd like to share your experience, please raise your hand so that we can enable you to speak. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, go ahead, Paul. Okay, thank you very much sir, for the presentation, Mr. Yomi. Actually, there's a department in my company which we don't have Nigerian in that department. How do you think we can imbibe the culture of uh, diversity bringing, and uh, ever since we have been uh, shortlisting applicants, we've never seen a Nigeria that is that competent to handle those jobs they do in that department. How do you think we can imbibe the culture of diversity? Okay, Paul. Just a minute, Paul, don't mention the organization, but what do they do in that department? What's the function, functionality required there? It's a kitchen department. Kitchen. So are they yes. cooking local or foreign dishes? Just foreign dishes, intercontinental and continental. Okay, over to you, Mr. Yomi. Yeah, take in now, man. Okay, thank you very much. A great question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, thanks, great, very great question. And sometimes you see that uh, some of us have to, have to be in that show. I'm going to give you two examples of what, what projects I was in. Um, you know that the, since somebody's phone is vibrating. Okay, thank you. So you know in the oil industry, the underwater divers, those are the people that go under the platform. Uh, virtually most of them are from Europe. Those guys earn crazy money, crazy money. They go under the water and they dive and they do stuff. And then it was discovered that in the Nigerian industry, there were no Nigerians in that old trade. 
And so these organizations decided that they wanted to get Nigeria. So they were that I won't tell the water divers. And then they wouldn't get, I know a friend of mine told me once that he doesn't understand all those job people, can they dive under the water? I said, somebody that is going to dive to go and weld. So one is a welder, but he can do underwater dive diving. I said, so that's not your job. The job man doesn't even know how to swim. They know how to survive in water. I said, have you noticed that all the people that represent us in most of the Olympics in swimming are not in jobs? I said, because swimming is different from surviving water survivor. So the person, hey, I didn't know the difference. Okay. So it was obvious that there was a need for us to recommend to the organization to train people to become that. Well, that's not and then, and then what was now discovered was that where they train to people come on that water divers for those for the oil industry is a center in London. No wonder Europeans were the one coming to do the job in Nigeria. So they said they were going to sponsor people. Then we now ask how much is a school fees? 10,000 pounds to train people. How really wants one in German or one in Shakirima or one in Larima to go and where is it going to get 10 million? Where is it going to get the visa? So the industry decided that they were going to put money together and then send people there. I mean, let me now tell you what to amuse you. This company had 10 scholarships. You, you go abroad, they pay you, they pay you for living, they pay you for $10,000 for training, then they give you a job when you come back. As at the time I finished that project, we only had four Nigerians willing to go on that water. So go for that training, only four Nigerians. They had to cancel the state scholarship because we didn't get people willing to go under water. Remember, this is not going under swimming pool, this is going under the ocean. So sometimes when you don't get people skilled enough in the job, you have to do what they call backward integration in terms of recruitment. And that means that, okay, I can't see people in the talent pool. I'm going to go into the talent pipeline. So, you know, there's a talent pool, you are looking for engineers, right? Now you realize I can't find Nigerians in this pool. Then you go to the pipeline. Where is the pipeline? Training institutions. Where are people trained? If there are no Nigerians trained to become what you are looking for, then there will not be any Nigerian. So you need to go and intervene there. So sometimes the question you ask is like, do I need to go into the training pipeline and look for people that I can train and then we can hire? Sometimes that's what you have to do. Sometimes what you have to also do is to ask that simple question. Can I convert some people into this role? So, for example, I, I you know, I, I don't have the full details of the role. So, I was in one organization, and the, the the lead inspector was a white man, and we said we wanted a white person, a black person, to be a lead inspector, and they said no, it's because he's not qualified. And I said, okay, I agree, he's not qualified. No, they said he's not knowledgeable enough to do the job. So I said, okay, how long does it take to train somebody to become a They said two years. So I went to speak with the head of the group to give me approval to ask the supervisor to develop a two-year training plan for this guy. That after two years, the guy is going to move into the job whether he's qualified or not. And the head of the organization says he agrees with that. Two years time, it was time for the guy to move in the job and the boss told me that uh, the guy is still not ready. I said, no, you remember we have two commitments. Commitment one, you will train him in two years. Commitment two is going to move into the job. If you failed it to train him in two years, you will not fail him in getting the job. This guy is going to move into the job. The guy said he's not ready. He went to tell the very senior people. I said, no, there were two commitments we have. Commitment one is that the guy will be trained in two years. Commitment two is that the guy will move into the job. So if he failed, and actually I feel that you people should give him a query where he failed to train him enough. The guy went to do the job and the guy is doing very well. The woman was just speaking English, the guy was couldn't do the job. Apparently, the guy could do the job even before he started the two-year training. So sometimes it's about commitment. Oh, our goal is to get an agent job. Put the responsibility on the line manager to look for who can do that. Thirdly, sometimes you will not get a Nigerian who lives in Nigeria. You may get a Nigerian who is abroad. You know, so maybe that's what you want to do. So I mean, looking at you, asking yourself, am I looking for uh, I need a coach for the Super Eagles. Uh, if I can't get a Nigerian who lives here, am I looking for a Sunday or let's say who coaches abroad, for example? So if there's a Nigerian who is in Bangladesh or who is in Ghana or who is in Togo who can do the job, why not? But the question is, the, the vision drives the strategy. You want Nigerians in the role, then you look for how to get those Nigerians, whether it's by converting people, whether it's by training people to become that, or whether it's by taking people from outside the country to come and do the job for you. That, that would be my view on that. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.
Any more questions? Somebody sent me a message that she wants to ask a question. I've actually tried to. No, Jim, are you asking a question? Uh, uh, something like that. Yes, sir. I would just want to ask. Um, hello, sir. Are you hearing me? Please go ahead, no, Jim. Go ahead. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, I just want to find out, uh, like, uh, in organizations where we have uh, uh, people that are in control, especially at the topmost level, that does not key in to what you are planning or what you are thinking in terms of this kind of inclusion and uh, diversity or whatever. So they seem to be seeing things from a different perspective. How do you kind of uh, let them see things from your own angle and without, uh, so to say, offending them, especially in an organization that is not uh, completely uh, multinational in nature or maybe not a big size, size organization, sir? Uh, thank you, my, thank you, sir. I can feel your concern. You know, sometimes to drive change could be problem, could be a problem. But you know, it's a typical change management mindset. Uh, people don't like change. The only people that like change are children in diapers. When their diapers are wet, they start crying, change my diapers. Every other person doesn't like change. So it's understandable that people will not do it. I think one thing that helps is for one to um, provide, keep providing education and training, right? Um, let people know the value. Sometimes people don't know the value. So to keep educating, keep providing information. I think it's also good to look for people in leadership that you think can understand this. So for example, you, you have a boss or one of your bosses, all the children are females, and you want to have more policies to aid girls or women. Hey, leverage on that guy say, oh, God, you know, these are our daughters that are all female. We must find a way to ensure they don't survive. I say, yes, so, yes, so, I mean, my child must be an engineering manager. Hey, so we must start to think about, wait, so why don't you give a scholarship for the best engineering students in this community? You know, you can leverage on their own personal values. For those who are Christians or Muslims, you can look for that to leverage. But sometimes, so you can train as a group. So if, for example, you have board uh, training development program, you can introduce diversity and inclusion there. You can also, let people understand the legal implication of what they are doing, you know, so that, you know, I mean, so you see a case where somebody was dis discriminated against because she was pregnant, then you can come and share the information. We can get into this trouble and because they don't have a policy. Like that. But you must know that resistance management is part of the change management process. So we should anticipate resistance. I mean, some of these places I've given examples some of those things didn't happen in year one that we started. Some people spoke, called you names. They said you wanted to do it because you wanted to bring your brother. I mean, yeah, you, 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 are, you are on a course for change. So there's a likelihood you'll be misunderstood. But the problem is, the issue is that you know what you want to achieve, you know the value. So don't get discouraged, don't get it but think about it to keep, don't lose, you don't lose the vision, right? Number two, keep providing education and information. Number three, separate the people and look for the people that have the least resistance. So for example, if you want to do more diversity and inclusion and you realize that there is a, the, everybody there is Yoruba, but one of them married Igbo or married Aousa, then there's somebody you can start to work on and say, okay, you, you understand this diversity and your madam is all oh, guys, uh, yeah, you know the how you have to deliberately speak language for him to understand. So when I talk about inclusion, that's what I'm saying. You're already doing it. When you say, let's have an inclusion policy, you write it down. And then some will change their mind. Some may not, but you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't stop giving the support as, as necessary. Okay, thank you so much. Ulushala Oyenino, please ask your question. Ulushala Oyenino, are you still around? If so, please ask your Yes, question. I am. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good and thank evening. you very much, sir. Please, I have. I have two, more, um, two questions to ask. The first one is um, the place of employers or HR as a whole, um, when they insist on recruiting only experienced staff, when no um, opportunity is given to those maybe new entries or uh, just graduating students. So is that not, I don't know, where does inclusiveness come in in that area? And then my second question is that where I work presently, my executive director, who doubles as the um, legal representative of the company, at the same time, the wife of the uh, managing director, she recently came up with a policy, with a uh, discussion 
that we should come up with a policy that says no female should uh, get pregnant, no female staff, no, no female employee is allowed to get pregnant until after two years of working with a firm. Otherwise, the female will either, either lose a job or will go for um, mark leave with no payment. So I, I felt, I don't know, I, I tried convincing her, but he said no, being a, she's also a lawyer, she's a lawyer, so he said even legally, it's not that anything that will affect the um, company's production. I, I tried to tell her that, okay, someone like me, I'm not, I've, I've not even experienced any yet, but I think every female, every married woman's um, dream is to get pregnant immediately, even if not almost immediately, to have children. So why would you stop them? So definitely you're not stopping only those that are looking for children. You're also stopping those that intend to get uh, married anytime soon. That in the next two years, if I still need this job, I don't know, is there any way, so can you advise me on ways we can convince her to try? I don't know if you get my point, sir. Yes, I do. I mean, thanks for asking. Uh, uh, the first one is around uh, people that ask the only one they experience people. I, you know, some 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 issues in HR, you may need to use different roads. Like you're about to say that one road does not lead to the market. So when organizations insist a lot on we only getting experience, experience, then you use succession planning as a tool. Diversity and inclusion you could use, but you could also use social media and say, okay. Everybody have hired, you know, I, again, let me give you a, a, a little example. When you said it, when I remember, I was doing this job for one group, it's, it's, a, it's a clinic. So the clinic uses a lot of contracts, uh, locum doctors, and have few full-time doctors. So the clinic got approval to hire doctors, and all the doctors they hired were between 50 and 55 years. The retirement age of the organization is, is 60. So I was speaking with the chief medical director that said, uh, I looked at your pipeline. You hired five new doctors. He said, yes, and that's the highest approval they have done in one single year. And all of them are, so I said, yes, they have big experience. I said, but all of them will retire in the next seven years. He said, yes. I said, so what is going to happen in seven years? He said, they will hire again. I said, so, so these doctors you have hired, and you only hired them for seven years. I said, so why did you hire five doctors who will retire in seven? Why didn't you retire three doctors that will retire in seven years? But hire two fresh doctors that will understudy those same people in the next seven years and become matured in seven years' time. That you have created a pipeline that is broken. Your, bro your pipeline will break in seven years. And you are going to have fresh doctors who will not have the experience and the tutelage of the older ones. So, you know, I, I'm not talking, I wasn't talking to you from the prism of uh, diversity. I was talking from the prism of succession planning. So that's something you may want to do and say, okay, create a succession planning planning um, um, to a system for the organization. And let people see graphically that in the next 15, in the next three years, all our people will leave. What, what happens to us then? Then that's when we start to say, okay, so what should we do and all of that? It could be something you want to, want to do. I hope they will, they will change their mind. And then the second question around pregnancy, I'm so happy you said Uma is a lawyer. I think you should just share all the decided cases in the National Industrial Court on discrimination against women and pregnant women. One of the examples is Clinton versus, actually, if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, if you send me a direct message on LinkedIn, I'll give you a couple of cases that you can refer to. I mean, the, most, the first one in Nigeria is, um, is the Clinton Foundation case. Uh, there was another case, uh, Federal, Federal Reporting Council of Nigeria versus uh, my camera or something, I can't remember. It was also a pregnancy-related case. Um, those are the two that come to my mind. But if you send me a message on LinkedIn, I can be able to provide you uh, those cases. And you can let her know that in Nigeria, in Nigeria, pregnancy discrimination is not a, an offense. But the African Charter on Human Rights calls it an offense. The International Labor Organization Convention on Pregnancy calls it an offense. And the Nigerian Industrial Court has repeated those things and said it is unlawful practice. And every organization that has gone to court on this issue has lost. So why do you want to put us at risk? Provide the data, provide the information. If she doesn't change her mind, it's the organization, you are just a child. Um, you may need to back up at some point and say, okay, I'm going to leave it this way, but I've provided you the information you have. And uh, when Casala busts, they'll remember you told them. 
Sometimes some battles we can't fight because people have just chosen to be headstrong. Thank you so much, sir. Pass on your key to you. Please unmute and ask your question. Pass on your key Good evening. You. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Big thanks to Mr. Yomi and uh, Mr. Oluyemi Adiosho. We appreciate you all. Over this uh, inclusion and diversity, I want to know, um, so there's something yet to understand. Is it an offense for an uh, organization to, to recruit a fee that is not related to what they are looking for to work in that field? For example, in my first and second degree, I did agricultural science. <laughs> And I went to a big hospitality industry around the cage. I don't want to mention the name. I did the first stage of the exam. I was called for second stage with food and beverage manager. We had a nice interview section. Another stage, I was called to meet with the manager. So when I was trying to sell myself, the man said, oh, you didn't even do anything related to the industry. Practically shouted at me. I felt so bad. So, but to date, they are still looking for that same role. And that same role is bartender. So I was like, the food and beverage manager interviewed me. Where, what was he thinking when he passed my paper to the manager, to the general manager? So I feel, is, is, is it a safe for an organization to be inclusive enough by giving a trial to those that have the will to do spirits? Those that you know this person, this person is passionate in trying and learning. So is it a sin to give the opportunity? And uh, I once had an interview with an organization recently. They said they are looking for zero to one year's experience. And they were asking me for experience of 30 years. Can we say they are inclusive enough? Thank you. Are they diversified enough? Thank you. Uh, interesting question. Thanks for asking, sir. Um, sometimes organizations just ask for unnecessary things, I mean, I mean, again, some organizations are a little bit in the woods. So sometimes they still hold to those old personnel management thought that only this can do this, only that can do that. So they may, they may be, they, they lose from the opportunity for cross, cross functional relevance. I mean, so for example, I mean, I studied estate management, I do HR. I mean, so if you said only people that study estate management, HR should do what I'm doing, uh, you, you lose that that's outside that view and bringing in. So, uh, so, but some organizations will not even hire you because you didn't do that. Again, let's also remember that there's some legal requirement that doesn't allow some people to do certain things, except they have some certain certification. So maybe that's part of what drives it. But I mean, they are the losers for it. I've also seen people, they will just peg it and say, I mean, I ask organizations, they say, one thirty eight twenty five 25 years experience. And okay, yeah, this was a church. This was a church, I remember now, this was a church, they wanted, a quantity surveyor that had 10 year experience to come and work for their church. So I asked them, I said, do you know how much a quantity surveyor makes on a job, on a contract? He said, no, I said, you know, quantity surveyors are paid as a percentage of the contract sum. So if I'm a QS on a uh, on 100 million construction, I'm going to get a percentage of the 100 pieces. I said, that's how they are paid. He said, yeah, hey, okay. I said, so you think there's a quantity surveyor who graduated 10 years ago that is looking for a job? They said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just asking now, are you saying that there is a 10 year old quantity surveyor that is unemployed that will come and work for you? I said, you won't get. Uh, they said, no, they will advertise probably. I said, if you get, come and tell me. They never got. So sometimes organizations learn because they make mistakes. Some of those extensive work experience is not necessary. And for me, sometimes I just ask, what, what, what do you mean by 10 years? How did you get to the 10 years experience really? Why is it not nine years or seven years or six years? Is there something magical about 10 years experience? I understand long experience is good, but it's not as if the 10 is like this. And you know, for anybody who has done HR for a while, there'll be sometimes you just have to take somebody that has less than 10 years because the best candidate and realize as good as 10 years. That would be my response. Okay, thank you so much. I think this will be a convenient time so that Professor Yomi can rest and prepare for service tomorrow as well. He's also a clergyman. So, sir, 
you have the floor for your closing remarks. Thank you so much for honoring us. We've been really, really refreshed, very enlightening, very engaging, multiple case studies and scenarios. Thank you so much for sharing with us your, your closing remarks. Okay, again, like I said, I have three goals. One, uh, to hope I can make advocates of diversity and inclusion. Two, for you to personalize those things. And three, to look for ways to start to do it in your organization. I, I hope I was able to achieve one of those three or all the three, but I think the world will be a better place when we have more people. I mean, every time the world calls those things, I always celebrate it all over the place. I mean, two years ago, for example, it was two years yesterday when the US, for example, saw in the first female black vice president who is female. US never had a female vice president. And the first time they did it was a, a black. So, you know, in one single, one shot, they caught two goals. They got the first female, they got the first black, you know. It, it was good. It gave hope to people at, at the end of it. And that's one thing that we must also think about, that when we open those doors for people that have been excluded for a long time, there's a likelihood that one child, one girl, one disabled person can know that you can aspire to be the best. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity and thanks again.